Okay, I'm going to try to finish up the synapses here, um, finishing up talking about the chemicals, and then getting into the types of synapses. So this is actually the very last slide of the um, previous PowerPoint, where we talk about serotonin and its involvement in um, the sleep-wakefulness cycle with eating and with aggression. We talked about the disorders and the antidepressant drugs and how those how those are working. But I wanted to put us back where we were because I still have a few things to say about serotonin. I'm not going to go through the whole biosynthesis. There it is for you. But I'm going to talk a little bit about the start of the biosynthesis, starting with tryptophan, and that it ends up with that 5-hydroxytryptamine, uh, which is the 5-HT, or what we sometimes shorten serotonin to, to be calling being called 5-HT. So tryptophan and why I want to do this beginning is uh, because it is an essential amino acid. There are people who um, are enough have enough kind of genetic likelihood to become depressed that even a low tryptophan diet can, can cause some amount of uh, depression in them. This is kind of how I feel. I know that um, I have depression for other reasons, but I know that I need those proteins in my diet and we do get tryptophan from the high proteins from um, fish eggs chicken tofu um, nuts things that are that are high in protein and i'm providing this um, picture that i got from another textbook that is showing the areas of the brain to which dopamine flows, so the dopamine pathways, and it's also showing the serotonin pathways, and you can see that there is some, some overlap there in the pathways, but they're also, they're also going to very, very different uh, regions as the dopamine is going up through the striatum, that's controlling the movement, uh, through the, and then from the uh, ventral tegmental area to the nucleus accumbens, uh, which is that uh, really influencing the reward center, uh, and get going up into the prefrontal cortex, which is uh, really helping us with, um, if it's healthy, we are not kind of more impulsive and, and so forth. We're inhibiting some of our, um, our impulses. And then serotonin going up through uh, some of those subcortical areas that we see from the raphe nuclei, but also up through the many, many different areas of the, of the cortex. And one of the reasons I leave this slide in here is to talk about the relationship between dopamine and serotonin. So there's really kind of a balance that uh, exists. Uh, one of the ways we also can cause ourselves some depression is by getting too much of the um, phenylalanine or tyrosine in our diets as those are larger amino acids and they I want to say they kind of bully their way across the blood-brain barrier at the expense of tryptophan. There is even one study where they gave um, young college students, young males, um, either a diet that was very high in tyrosine, so they gave them uh, corn and aspartate, so um, Diet Coke, and those young men were more likely to get into arguments and to actually become violent uh, with each other and aggressive with each other than young men who are given a, a different diet. So it's we can lower our serotonin in other ways and there is this kind of balance. And one of this what, what this makes is one of the problems we might see is if we have some depression and we have attention deficit disorder, um, I'm sorry, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, that raising that serotonin with a selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor can lower the dopamine to a, to a point where we become really overly, so overly impulsive that it's, it's uh, problematic. So this is, these are some of the things that we have to keep in mind as we're prescribing drugs, that there are these relationships between, and often a balance between uh, many of these different neurotransmitters. Dopamine also has its balance with acetylcholine, as we'll say, well, as we'll see um, eventually down the road, as well as with glutamate. I'm going to talk briefly about nitric oxide. If you remember, it is the um, it's a gas transmitter, and it is released. Oftentimes, it is the negative feedback that is sent from the postsynaptic neuron to the presynaptic neuron, 
letting the presynaptic neuron know, hey, you've already sent me a message and, and um, inhibiting uh, further communication. It's also a gas that's released by small local neurons when they're active. And so it's, there's more nitric oxide in these areas of the brain where there's high activity, which also allows for the dilation of blood vessels and more blood to flow to that area because we're gonna need more blood, we're gonna need more oxygen in an area where we just used the oxygen. Um, those neurons are using oxygen out of the blood. Most neurotransmitters are stored in synaptic vesicles. Uh, nitric oxide is not, again, it is, it is a gas. Um, those vesicles, we have a lot of them in the presynaptic terminals. Uh, neurons can accumulate excess levels of neurotransmitter uh, in those presynaptic terminals. And so neurons have a way to uh, stop that accumulation. Uh, so I have the example here, neurons that release serotonin, dopamine, or norepinephrine, they all contain this monoamine oxidate, oxidase, sometimes shortened to um, MAO. That enzyme breaks down those neurotransmitters and makes them inactive, which, so that stops this really uh, excess of, of accumulation of the neurotransmitters. So one of the older antidepressants that does not get used very often anymore, but if it's sometimes used as a, a last defense if, if we've tried many antidepressants with someone and, and nothing was, is working as an MAO inhibitor. So it's inhibiting this enzyme and it's allowing a little bit more accumulation of those neurotransmitters because, because what we're assuming is that's, that's where the issue lies. They don't have quite enough serotonin, dopamine, or uh, norepinephrine. And as I kept saying with that simple picture of one neuron communicating to another neuron, and I kept saying it's more complicated, it's more complicated. Uh, we're gonna, so some of the complication is not just in, right, that I'm communicating to many, many neurons, and many, many neurons are communicating to me, most likely. But we, so another piece of this is that we're probably a neuron, most neurons are releasing a combination of um, more than one neurotransmitter, so two or more neurotransmitters. Uh, and at least one kind of neuron releases different neurotransmitters from different bran branches of its axon. So uh, I have the example, an example here of motor neurons. They have one branch that's going to the muscles. And as I mentioned, it's always between a motor neuron and a, and a muscle. We are releasing acetylcholine. They have another branch coming off the, the end of the axon there to communicate to other um, spinal cord neurons. And those branches are releasing acetylcholine and, and glutamate. So that's another kind of level of just um, complexity. So I, as a receiving neuron as well, I can be responding to many different neurotransmitters at these different synapses uh, all at the, at the same time as part of that neural integration. And so to a large extent, what we're doing with neurotransmitters with these excitatory and inhibitory messages, they are like the ones and zeros in our computers, right? We can do a whole lot with simply on off messaging but messages are actually more complicated um, and varied than just on off so when a neurotransmitter attaches to a receptor site the receptor may open a channel and i'm going to talk about this for a little bit here that which are called ionotropic effects they are allowing in ions <clears throat> or it may produce a slower but longer lasting effect which are called metabotropic effects i'm going to talk about that as really kind of changing the metabolism of the cell so I'm first going to talk about the ionotropic effects, which is how we're just influencing ion flow. Are we allowing those ions to flow to, into a neuron, or are we closing off the gate and stopping those ions from flowing? So this is the opening and closing of these ligand-gated channels, as they are called, where ligand uh, is a word meaning chemical. Sometimes they're called transmitter-gated channels. So those neurotransmitters are, are chemicals, um, and again, we can we can have the same effect as one of the neurotransmitters by uh, taking a particular psychotropic drug. So it's doing the same kind of ligand-gated, chemical-gated work, or we can oppose that, um, that particular neurotransmitter, if you remember from my very short stint of talking about uh, drug effects. These occur very quickly. They occur within one millisecond with a half-life of five milliseconds. So they happen and then they, and then they stop. Um, this is really important for any kind of information processing where the speed of updating that information is important. So visual and auditory information, 
we need that information. We need to deal with that information very quickly. And so these are uh, ionotropic um, effects on these neurotransmitters. I have written here uh, most excitatory ionotropic synapses are glutamate. If you remember, I said that's a widely widely distributed excitatory neurotransmitter. And most inhibitory ionotropic synapses are GABA, my uh, widely distributed inhibitory neurotransmitter, um, GABA, gamma aminobutyric acid. Those are um, those are just the most common of those. But we also we also see other neurotransmitters having this. Um, ionotropic kind of effect. So just as examples of two more neurotransmitters that can ha that have ionotropic effects, glycine in the spinal cord is an inhibitory neurotransmitter that has an ionotropic effect. It really um, stops us from contracting muscles too much. Uh, acetylcholine is um, often, and in most cases, it's an excitatory ionotropic. So those nicotinic receptors are um, having an ionotropic effect. And that's what's really being shown in the picture there. And part of the reason I bring up acetylcholine is to talk about this picture where if we look at the, the um, ion channel and we see it in A, that out, kind of outer portion, the red portion is embedded in the membrane and the inner portion would, is a sodium channel. But when you look at it, A in comparison to B, you can see that the sodium channel is, is closed. It's not allowing in any sodium. Uh, which if you remember that's a um, positively charged ion so we're going to depolarize our neuron this way in b um, acetylcholine attaches to that um, receptor and we see that inner portion open up and allow in the, the sodium so again an ionotropic effect is just the flow of ions and i'm going to talk about metabotropic effects for just a little bit longer because they are they involve this second messenger system they're a little bit more in, involved um, so we initiate a sequence of metabolic reactions uh, these emerge 30 milliseconds or more after the release of the neurotransmitters and they uh, typically last up to a few seconds sometimes longer so these neurotransmitters that influence um, mood uh, hunger and things like that that are more um, slow and long-lasting uh, are having these metabotropic effects. And some examples, so serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, sometimes glutamate and GABA, but um, so they act differently depending on the kind of glutamate and the kind of GABA. And I've tried to remain really simple, and I usually do this um, somewhere with the neurotransmitters, but there are there are just different kinds of, so we'll talk about two different kinds of glutamate when we talk about learning and memory. There are multiple different kinds of dopamine, and I think they have the names like dopamine 1, dopamine 2, dopamine 3. There are different kinds of histamine. There are different kinds of, of serotonin as well. As I say, I like to work from pictures because I think it helps us to visualize how some of this is happening. Um, so working from this picture, a neurotransmitter is going to attach to our metabotropic receptor. And what happens then is we see this bending of the, pro the receptor protein that is going through the membrane. And when that receptor protein bends like that, the other side of the receptor, we have this uh, G protein that, that was attached and that bending causes the G protein to, to detach where the G protein is just this um, protein coupled to guanosine triphosphate, which is an energy storing molecule. And that, that G protein is going to act as a second messenger. It's going to take its energy somewhere else into the cell. Uh, one of the, I think it's actually your author who describes this kind of weird uh, situation, but I think it's helpful. I'm not really sure that it's helpful, but if it is helpful, um, we can think of it kind of like uh, I want to ha I want to see the rabbits start to move and I have my dog and my dog is in a, in a cage. This is a really weird analogy, but and then my dog is in a cage and I go in with a stick or something and I rile up my dog and open the cage. And so that dog is acting as the G protein because now uh, the dog is going to go upset the rabbits. Well, this is the um, energy of the and what's going on within the cell is or what we're going to call the, the rabbits in this case. I'm not really sure that analogy helps, but if it does, 
Uh, good. So the second messenger is then communicating with other areas of the cell. And it might just be this simple opening and closing of ion channels, just less, less directly. Uh, but sometimes we see the um, an altering of the production of activating proteins or activating um, that, that it activates chromosomes. So we see differences in um, gene activity and gene, gene expression uh, from some of these metabotropic effects. And this is more important for more enduring effects. So sometimes these last these effects last you know 20 minutes or so. Uh, taste, smell, hunger, thirst, pain, where the fast timing, um, that kind of fast information processing is not as important. Uh, and then we also see that this is important for many aspects of things like arousal, attention, pleasure, and emotion. So as you can imagine, things like serotonin, um, and dopamine that are, are influencing our um, arousal level, our, our mood, our attention, our hunger, Eat, wait, eating and so forth and sleep cycles that's those are metabotropic effects so um, I'm going to distinguish now neuropeptides from other neurotransmitters and your author does this really nicely in a, in a table that I think puts everything together uh, so clearly neuropeptides are often referred to as neuromodulators there are other neurotransmitters that we sometimes call neuromodulators, so uh, serotonin <clears throat> is a neuromodulator, but um, the neuropeptides are neuromodulators, and they're behaving differently than the other neurotransmitters. So when I talked about how the action potential affects um, the release of neurotransmitters at that presynaptic terminal, I was really talking about neurotransmitters in that, in that case. Um, neuropeptides are, they behave a bit differently, so they're not synthesized in that presynaptic terminal. Um, for release there. Instead, they are synthesized in the cell body and they start to travel down the axon. So we have them in the cell body and when they get released, then they're mostly released uh, from the dendrites, uh, but also from the cell body and from the sides of the axon. And they're going to diffuse to a wide area of the brain, partly them, themselves diffusing out from the, from the cell um, and traveling, but also uh, they release they have this effect on their neighboring cells such that they are releasing neuropeptides too. So you can see why we call this this neuromodulation. Uh, they are not released by the single action potential as I was talking about the neurotransmitters before. This is when a neuron has repeated depolarization. Uh, so we see more than one action potential and that's, re that's repeating that then we get within we release neuropeptides. Again the duration of these effects can be uh, many minutes instead of being um, more generally that that fewer than uh, less than a second or a few seconds or so. So one of the most common or one of the ones that I talk about in more classes than than other neuropeptides are, are these endorphins, which endorphins really comes from endogenous morphine. Uh, they resemble those opiate drugs in structure. We actually discovered them uh, with this logic of opiate drugs work. We must have some kind of chemical in the brain that is, is performing the same job and fitting into those same receptor sites, or we would not have those receptor sites. Uh, and this is where they came up with this um, as calling them endogenous morphine. They have an inhibitory effect and they play a role in pain relief and response to stress, they also contribute to the regulation of eating behavior. So um, if you've ever, so when I was young, I was on the track team. And I really enjoyed my runner's high, have to say. Those natural endorphins, that runner's high, is um, a great feeling as you start to have um, your basic pain and you have this runner's high and it's, it feels you're relaxed and you just don't care so much about the pain and you're also not hungry at that point. And when we talk about pain, we will talk about these two neuropeptides again, endorphins and substance P. So substance P is released when um, we are having some kind of pain. It transmits signals about pain and inflammation to the brain. One of the, um, I, don't wanna, I don't know, I want to call it uh, pain relief, ways of relieving pain is to use capsaicin. Um, and at first, so what's that's going to do, and it's, this is especially for that sort of um, longer term pain, like arthritis or something, 
that at first that capsaicin, so capsaicin is what is in um, many of our hot peppers. And if you know about when you get this on your hands and you can kind of feel uh, this tingling, uh, this is the, we're deplete, we are transmitting signals of, to the brain using substance P that we have this kind of pain, uh, but it can cause a depletion of that substance P. And so if I have this more longer term pain like, like arthritis and I put capsaicin on it, it can um, make it so that I'm not feeling that pain. I've depleted the substance P. Okay, so my final slide is this summary of uh, some of drugs and their effects. This is not a be-all, end-all. This does not describe all the different methods and ways that drugs can either act as an agonist. So remember, if I'm mimicking the effect of a neurotransmitter or raising the effect of a neurotransmitter, I'm an agonist. If I'm blocking or stopping the effects of a neurotransmitter, I'm an antagonist. And this can happen in many ways. And here's just a few to give you a, a feel of... Um, that yes, this, this can happen, and um, there are many different methods for um, how drugs have their effects. So if you, we're going to start at the top and move around kind of clockwise. Up at the top from diet, we get tyrosine, uh, phenylalanine, which becomes tyrosine. Uh, and that, if you remember, the biosynthesis is going to become DOPA, which is going to become dopamine. Uh, AMPT is a drug that stops that synthesis from tyrosine to um, DOPA. So it's an antagonist stopping the biosynthesis. Uh, people who take L-DOPA for their Parkinson's, uh, that DOPA is, that passes through the blood-brain barrier and allows for more DOPA to be in the neurons. And so that acts as an agonist, because it allows for the synthesis. synthesis. <clears throat> um, moving around to where he's showing this via MAO, so that is the monoamine oxidase inhibitor. Can, if I'm getting an excess of dopamine especially, but my monoamine oxidase inhibitor is going to break down dopamine as if there is an excess there. And so if we take a monoamine oxidase inhibitor, <clears throat> that is going to act as um, an agonist because it's going to allow more dopamine to, to stay there. Uh, uh, cocaine, the way it works is by blocking reuptake. So again, one of the ways it works, it also furthers the release, but um, it blocks reuptake. So again, acting as an agonist, letting that dopamine stay in the synaptic cleft and have more effect on the postsynaptic neuron. Uh, typical antipsychotics, the way they act is they are what's called a direct antagonist. They fit into the um, same receptor sites that dopamine fits into, but they don't influence that postsynaptic neuron. So they're basically directly blocking the dopamine from getting into those uh, receptor sites. And then as we move around to the other kind of the counterclockwise to our left there, um, cannabinoids uh, fit into these receptors of um, anandamine and um, 2-AG, and those are um, basically like our, our autoreceptors that are um, recognizing our own neurotransmitters, so me as the neuron sending my neurotransmitter, and then it fits into my own autoreceptors so that I know that I just sent a message and it, it, it inhibits further release. Well, the cannabinoids fit in there and inhibit further release, so they act as an antagonist. So again, just to show you that drugs can have their influences in, in many uh, different ways, and I don't think your author goes into this amount of detail about drugs and how they have their effects. So this is just kind of um, the introduction for when we get to substance abuse, but just so it's it's there uh, in the back of your mind. You don't need to memorize all of this from a, from a picture because this is what I'm, I'm giving you. But this seemed like a good place too to, to stop. I'm running, I think I ran just a little bit over, so I think I, I owe you guys two minutes uh, next, next week sometime. And um, yeah, and I didn't quite finish up synapses, but we are almost, we are almost finished. And then we'll get into neuroanatomy. Uh, it's Friday, so have a good weekend. Um, hope everyone's doing well, staying safe, staying healthy.